The Evolve with Pete Evans podcast is a conversation about my favorite ingredients for a healthy human experience. We take an informed look at topics that include nutritional and emotional well-being as well as expanded consciousness. I love exploring the topics that are not traditionally taught at school and take a deep dive into them with my special guests. I invite you to sit back and come along for the ride with an open mind and heart and please share with your family and friends as these podcasts may just be the seed from which many things will flourish from. Cheers. We've been using Waters Co. water filters for the last 10 years and I wholeheartedly trust my family's health with them. Waters Co., established 1977, have personal and domestic water filters, which turns your ordinary tap water into great tasting, alkaline, ionized mineral water, which removes up to 99.9% of fluoride, heavy metals, chemicals and bacteria, so you can love your tap water again. The Bio 1000 is the latest edition of the BMP 1000 model and the culmination of over 40 years of experience and research into water filtration by some of the world's leading scientists. Waters Co. was first to market with natural gravity-fed systems, creating alkaline water way back in 1984, and have continued to lead the market in research and development, setting the benchmark for all other brands to follow. Please go to my webpage, PeteEvans.com, to learn more and to receive your special discount from my link on the products page. You're going to love it. Rodney Cullerton was elected to the Senate in 2016. He ended politics fighting for a royal commission into the banks. The evidence he submitted to the financial services inquiries was lethal, and no matter how hard the government tried to stop the royal commission, they could not. Rod Cullerton is also an advocate for a constitutional judicial system. He stood up to those who were trying to undermine the rights of the Australian people by not upholding the Commonwealth Constitution, and he continues to bring this to light as he fights for justice in the courts. After being thrown out of Parliament, another move that was against the process of the Constitution, Rod Cullerton now leads the Great Australian Party in order to bring about the change that all Australians need, for them to have a fair go. To find out more about Rodney Cullerton, please visit thegreataustralianparty.com.au. That's greataustralianparty.com.au. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you, brother? I'm well, thanks. And yourself? Mate, fantastic. Having a great day. The sun's shining, the birds are, <laughs> the birds are singing outside. I've got a nice cup of tea here. And I've been yeah, well, for- I've, uh, so you're in Sydney, I'm in West Australia, and it's fresh here. It's, it's not warm, but it's not bitterly cold either. It's just, it's crisp. So, yeah, good morning, and the sun's shining. Beautiful. What more could you ask for? Absolutely. Good <laughs> way to start the meeting. It is. I actually had a fellow on last week. I haven't entered into politics in my life. I'm a 46, nearly 47-year-old man, and I don't really know too much about it. It's never been, it's never called to me to actually learn more about it until now. For some reason at the moment, I'm watching what's happening in America. I'm watching what's happening in Australia. I'm watching our neighbours and our, our cousins over in New Zealand and I'm watching a lot of, uh, and I said it the other day on the podcast with the New Zealand fellow that stepped up to create a movement. I said, there seems to be a lot of fuckery going on at the moment. And what I mean by that is a lot of things just are not making a lot of sense. And it seems to be coming from the top down. And someone reached out to me and said, you are a decent fella that I should speak to, to get your perspective or perception on politics what is going on now and the future and what potentially we could do as Australians in this country. So thank you for accepting my invitation. Yeah, well, look, can I tell you, politics is for everyone. And going back in 2015, I mean, my whole family would never ever would have imagined I'd become a federal senator. And I didn't think I'd come because I never, no offence to politicians, the best way to describe a politician is he looks like a very sleek powerboat, polished chrome exhaust pipes, but they have, they they make a lot of noise, but there's no prop Mm. and there's no power. And I didn't, it wasn't by choice. Pauline Hanson was in the public gallery when I gave evidence at a Senate inquiry at the Novotel Wentworth in Sydney. 
and she approached me and said, you need to become a senator for federal parliament. And I said, Pauline, you could pay me a million dollars and I would never become a political tosser. I just would not because I've been a farmer. I'm a country boy. You know, I've been a broadacre farmer for a number of years, been in the wool industry. And I'm very passionate about rural Australia because the cities prosper on the well-being of rural Australia because a lot of the commodities that are sold outside the farm gate or through the farm gate, that revenue stream comes down back into the city. So it's like, you know, it's like all the creeks running into the river. So it's important that we must look at our where our values lie. Mm-hmm. So look, and I declined it. You know, she said, look, it's worth nearly $199,000 a year. I said, I'm not interested. And then, of course, when I, we took a fight up against the bank and I noticed you and I have got something in common, we've both been on 60 Minutes, you know, we were seeing our primary producers who have been around for generations, they've cleared the land. You know, I had one here yesterday, has farmed 40,000 acres. You know, I've farmed up to, you know, up to 15,000 acres at one point. Now, they're broad acre farms. And, you know, to be a farmer, when you go to a bank, the bank only ever lends you 60%. So the 40% is the grower's skin in the game. So he's a good LVR, loan to value ratio uh, customer. Mm -hmm. And of course, all these tangible assets. But we were seeing a massive move on trying to have the banks, you know, put the farmers on an hors d'oeuvre plate, a plate of hors d'oeuvres up to China to sell off a lot of the farms. And they were creating these non-monetary defaults on these farmers and they'd never defaulted. And, you know, perfect enterprises and a lot of them were able to sustain the shutting down of the cattle trade and it's like anything you know you can have a ferrari car but if you stop the cash flow we're seeing this now with the covid19 where you cut the cash flow off on a business doesn't matter how well the business performs if it hasn't got that fuel going into it it comes to a stop and that's what we were seeing right around australia so we stood up to that as farmers we actually stood up and took them head on And we saved a lot of farms. We saved a lot of farmers that were going, you know, there were a lot that committed suicide. They were shunned in their local community. And it was a really, really abhorrent time, to be honest. I mean, we've seen two abhorrent times. We've seen where the government in 1993 put out a mandate to execute, you know, 20 million young sheep and they were gassed and shot. And, you know, the people today don't realise, you know, what, this Australian government has done over the years. And they are things that it doesn't matter how well you perform, if someone knocks the tail feathers out of your ass, you don't flap that well. And this is what's been happening. So we stood up and that was a 60 minute program. And what happened to one of my outfits over in Gyra, because I was a manufacturer as well, we value added all our commodity off the farm. We had an enterprise in Gyra, New South Wales and on the farm. We're making thoroughbred feeds for thoroughbred industry. And I got in an altercation with a person who rocked up in a tow truck to assert his authority without orders and the key got lost in an altercation. I have every right to protect the assets of a company and my property and ended up going to court and I got convicted in absentia because I actually couldn't get over to Armidale logistically from Western Australia because... Coincidentally, they actually put the two matters of the straw bale incident, which was a 60-minute program, and they convicted me in absentia, and that was the lowest point, and I picked up the phone to Pauline Hanson because she'd been ringing me after the submissions to the Senate inquiry on the banks quite a few times, and I picked up the phone and I said, I'll run, and that's what I did, and I went into to Parliament, and when I went into Parliament as a federal senator, we had to attend early with the clerk of the Senate and have a course on what a senator's role is. And I just absorbed it like a sponge. I just loved it. It was the history of Australia. It was talking about the constitution, how I give an oath to my fellow countrymen pursuant to the constitution, section 42 off memory. I think that's the the clause, but or the section, and it meant a lot to me. It was like I was being chosen for the Olympic Games and representing my country, and 
and I fought hard. I, I went in there and, you know, I've gone down in the statute books in the law and put the Queen back in the High Court and, you know, I mean, here's the High Court been operating without the Queen, so where does it get its authority from? And we just seem to, people just tend to think, oh, look, it's just a general acceptance or it's now a truism. No, all I'm interested in is the law. And there has been a departure. And once I brought that departure to the attention of not only the High Court, but the Australian government, well, then they just set upon me and made it pretty difficult. But, you know, like I said in an interview, I was just caught in a legal rip. I'm not going to panic. I'll swim to the side, just float on my back for a while. And, you know, last thing you want to do is panic. You've got to hang in there, hang in strong, because all Australians, we must protect our democracy and free speech. And Look, I see comments on you, I see comments on me, but when you go out in the front line, people are always going to be shooting at you from the other side and we have to stay strong, be true to our values and operate pursuant to the laws of the Commonwealth. And that's why I've never taken my off the ball because that is my sworn public duty to the people of Australia and I would never turn my back on that as hard as it gets. I would never turn my back on it. It's my commitment. Uh, Thanks for explaining and I, I would like for you to educate me Let's just start off with the real basics here. What is the government in place to do? What is their role? The government, okay, how it works is the people have the supreme power. That's democracy in this country under our constitution. So when they go to vote at the ballot box, if you notice that all the politicians or the political parties will come out and say, we're going to do this for you, we're going, so they're making an offer to the public. The public go, yeah, I I like that. So they go and vote at the ballot box. And when they vote at the ballot box, in effect, they're putting their power of attorney into the person that they want to have best represent them in Parliament, because that's democracy. That's the Westminster system. But the point is, when they're getting into Parliament, they're not representing the people. And that's where the fall down, it's all a big promise, but when they get in there, they go lax. So when a politician is elected, like myself, you become a public trustee. That is your role. You are a public trustee and the beneficiaries are the people that elected you. So you must act in the best interest of the beneficiaries without getting too complicated. But I'm telling you, this is the format. This is the law of it. So you are a public trustee, act in the best interest. So when you take an oath, that is your commitment. And people say, ah, yeah, but an oath doesn't mean much any day. Well, start telling that to a court because they won't accept an affidavit or a stat deck or An oath is a commitment. So the person gives an oath pursuant to the the constitution in federal parliament and then through that oath, his office empowers him to act as a public trustee. So he has the powers of the law behind him to go forward and enter parliament and... Him or her. Yeah, him or her. No discrimination here. But I guess when I talk about it, I talk about myself. So so that's the basic principle of it. And so when you have 12 senators out of every state, the purpose of 12 federal senators is to make sure that their role, they have a constitutional role. So they go into the upper house and they must and shall overseer and make sure that the states are compliant to the laws of the Commonwealth. Okay, the states can't rise above the laws of the Commonwealth and go off and do this and that. It must be under that constitution. And unfortunately, I have to say to your viewers, that hasn't been happening. And the senators that are up in the House are all asleep at the wheel. And their constitutional duties have been operating under a departure from the Crown. And it has been since 1973. And nothing will take that away from me because my advisers in Parliament, through the Parliamentary Library, that was a good thing about getting into Parliament, was to not look at an inference, was to put my cave divers right down into the depths of the parliamentary archives and come up with the constitutional report where the highest legal minds in Australia went because there was a concern that Whitlam had departed Australia from Commonwealth law to Australian law and created an adopted title and took us down this de facto republic. And that's a fact. I've filed it all in London and the system can't rebut it. It is. It is what it stands. And the people now need to be aware of this, 
otherwise we don't have a democracy. We don't have free speech and we will never have these parliamentarians act because under the system they run, they don't recognise us as an authority after the day that they're, they're chosen. So you have a case before the UK High Court, I believe. Yeah. What does that mean? I have filed an application in the High Court of London. It's unprecedented. It's all paid for. And I send a legal advisors over there to attend to it, uh, CO588 of 2020. And that's the respondents to that, the Chief Justice of the West Australian Supreme Court, the Attorney General of the West Australian Parliament and the Governor of Western Australia. So, yeah, it's a pretty important, influential case. And it's even got stronger because the original tribal sovereign federation, the OSTF, which is the original tribal people, have filed an intervention and they've actually given me the treaty pelt, which is a, which predates federation and their law sticks. And a lot of the farmers have also filed as interveners because a lot of the farms have been taken through a jurisdiction that is not Crown compliant. And so we've taken it to a very high level now because that's what we have to do. So, so what does that mean in simple language for, for the listeners to understand? What, what is it that you're attempting to prove or illustrate under the law? What does it mean? Well, it shows that we've been in a de facto republic. I think people understand that there are certain parts of, well, certainly the Labor Party and Malcolm Turnbull have pushed for a republic. Bob Hawke had, Whitlam had, and the people wanted to stay under the laws of the UK pursuant to the Constitution Act. But so because they weren't successful in the referendum, they wanted to create this jurisdiction so they could go forward with their agenda. And my whole role is to bring it back to where it's supposed to be, and that's under the laws of the Commonwealth for honest government. So that's the ethos of the whole application. So So when you say the correct term, was it a de facto republic or what were the two words that you used? A de facto republic. So essentially, under the Australian government, the Australian government is not the Commonwealth Parliament. And when you look at an Australian government and you go to the Constitution and say, where does it refer to the Australian government? It doesn't recognise it. And that's a real problem. And there has to be this correction. And, you know, the 1988 Constitutional Report, which is the evidence whereby the highest legal minds in Australia undertook a commission and they said that there was a departure. But no one's gone along and remedied the, the, you know, there's the diffs come off, the tail shafts come off the diff, yet the car's rolling down the hill. But until they go to go up, there's no power. And that's what we're saying. Currently, at the moment, there's no power. So everything's going along on a general acceptance or some truism. But when you bring it back to the law and what the parliament has prescribed, there's no power, Pete. And that's a real concern for Australia. (laughs) So are you saying that the government at the moment is operating outside of the law? I'm not saying it. The law is saying it. I'm not making any claims. The law says it and the constitution says it. And the parliament... It's not running as per the parliament has prescribed. And that is the role of a senator. And if it takes a farmer to go into parliament and spot it within, you know, I think within eight weeks I spotted it. I mean, you know, here we are. The High Court has to now say God save the Queen before every hearing because former Senator Brandis claimed in the chamber I was the first person to spot the problem. But no one's... (laughs) No one's actually fixing the problem. And what I have to do under a sworn public duty is is come out to the people and say, here's the problem. I'm now supplying all the evidence and the evidence has been filed in London because the whole purpose of why the High Court says or the Australian government says they can't hear appeals in London is because that we're under Australian law. But if we're under Commonwealth law, they can hear an appeal. So it's up to the people. If we want to accept an Australian law and be dealt with by an administrative process on something that, you know, when you go into court, favours the other side, like a bank or the corporations or whatever you 
that's that you shall be known by your acts and actions. But if you don't, when it comes down to your right, and we all have a right under the Constitution, because that was what was ratified at Federation, well, no, I'll get dealt with under the laws of the Commonwealth. And there you go. And that, that's why when I was taken to court, I couldn't actually, as a federal senator, although there's a, that's why I say I'm in exile, because the actual writ is a problem with the writ. So, you know, I picked it up and I had to say, well, yes, I'm an elected federal senator for Western Australia, but I could never claim that I was a duly elected senator for Western Australia. And look, I just, you know, I could never live with myself if I didn't tell the people. And the people have got sort of up to critical mass and now we've got this, you know, shut down and everything going on for distraction. But really, we must come back under our laws, Peter. You know, being a farmer, it's one thing we do happen to do well. We can problem solve, you know, like we can be down the back paddock and, you know, we can make things work and, and get through. And I've problem solved on this. You know, I've had my outstanding team who, are, you know, I could go to war with and they, they're just fantastic and, and passionate and committed and, and they're behind the party. But, yeah, no, we had to carry this one through because it's my duty for the next generation. I don't want to be the generation that was given the baton and I didn't run down the, you know, keep running in the race. It's our duty to carry the baton through to the next generation. And, unfortunately, at the moment, we've sort of, we're operating under this pretended jurisdiction and that's very concerning for democracy. And that's not an inference, the evidence. and. Yeah, that's what's filed in London. So who knows about this in government? Is it a known fact? Have you made it? Yes. Have yeah. you brought the awareness to people and was there shock? Was there disbelief? Was there scepticism? There was just silence. And I wrote to Malcolm Turnbull because let me, I don't want to be the hero on this, but one of the things was everyone sort of had forgotten about the constitution and people say, ah, oh, look, the constitution, it's old hat or whatever. No, it's the foundation law. The parliament operates under it. It runs everything, right? So if you don't have that, con it's like a constitution of a business, if you don't have it. And these, these public trustees, who are the people we elect, have got fiduciary duties. And there are serious penalties if they don't perform as a public trustee and they can lose their job. So one of the methods I used, I actually kicked off section 44 of the constitution and then all of a sudden you saw all those senators get pulled in or members of parliament. But, you know, so that we bought the constitution out back front and centre. But if you notice, everything died down. I think it claimed 16 scalps and then they had to go to a few by-elections. But, you know, it was like me. You know, I've been in the chamber and I've witnessed legislation and, and motions being passed when the Senate's not sitting corrate. They've got to have 19 senators in there, and they don't, and they're passing legislation. And I, I just sit back and say, well, how does this keep going on? And that's what I brought up to Pauline Hanson and to George Brandis, and, yeah, I, I got uh, grilled for it. So what do you do? The law says the Senate must be corrate and there must be 19 members sitting, not half standing, sitting in the Senate. And in a lot of cases, there hasn't been. And I hmm. think that's very sad. A friend asked me to ask you a question about the dead fictitious corporate queen of Australia and when and how she usurped the queen in 1973 under the Whitlam government. Do you know what that means? That's what the 1988 constitutional report has confirmed that, you know, there was a lot of issues around the sacking of Gough Whitlam, but the constitutional report makes the claim under the law, so does the constitution, they claim to have set up this Queen of Australia. And it's a bit like you, if you go in to sign any document, you would go in as Peter, middle name Evans, or mm -hmm. I'd go in as Rodney Norman Cullerton. I can't go in as... Rodney Norman Cullerton Mackenzie. And a clause two of the Constitution claims it's the Queen of the United Kingdom. So this Queen of Australia is a pretended authority. And that's what the Constitution report has stated. It's a pretended authority 
and it's the authority that's running in Australian law, which is the law that we, you know, we're under now. It's not the authority. And people say, yes, but, you know, why hasn't the Queen come in and she's to protect us? Because that's how the system works. She's given her coronation oath and that's what protects us as, and that's why we live such a great life in Australia without getting too technical. But the Queen is just, she has an oath of office and she can only be moved on the chessboard by the advice of her ministers. So if her ministers are under (laughs) Australian law, how can they advise the Queen? And that's where it's all falling down. And, you know, I've experienced some very good stuff in the courts lately. I attended the court the other day and I address the judge from the public gallery. I, and even the security guard said they've never ever seen that ever happen. In, <laughs> I think one's been there 20 years. He said, I've never seen this happen before. What does that mean exactly? Well, because the 60 minute show and people can go on to 60 minutes as farmers fighting back. I was charged for stealing a motor car. That was the one that there were straw bales around the car. The car stayed there. The banks were trying to repossess a farm. He still got his farm today. They didn't have court orders. We got them off. But because I was the ringleader, they charged me. The receivers had to get a lift back to town with the police. There was 29 police officers came to Dixon's farm that day on a civil matter. I mean, can you believe that? On a civil matter, 29 police officers. And they took the receivers off and took them back to the station and the car was left at Bruce Dixon's but there were straw bales around the car and so the thing is I left and they ended up doing me because I was the ringleader so effectively that's still before the courts today because we're asking the court to attend to its first duty and be within jurisdiction and as the parliament's prescribed and the West Australian Supreme Court is finding it very difficult to come into jurisdiction and that's the thing that's yeah, it's been going on for four years now, I suppose. But, you know, I have to just hold strong because I'm a person that's been, you know, not many people get elected as a senator. And I've managed to get up into the top end of town there and seen it for my own eyes. And I've got a sworn public duty, like I say, and I must uphold the law. And that's all I'm doing. And I guess we just keep going along. So I hope I'm not getting too complicated no, for you. No. I'm trying to, it is complex, but once you understand the concept of it, which I happen to be an inventor as well, so understand concepts, yeah, you know, so if there's anything you're a little bit grey on, ask me and then I can try and uh, better explain it. But let's, I'm grateful for your stories and for your personal experience in this and explaining it to the best of your ability to Mm. someone a little bit naive like myself. No, I don't know. And I'm being completely honest here. As I said at the start, I don't know too much about politics, like very, 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 very little. It's never been something that has needed my attention personally, whereas now I can see that there's some interesting stuff happening globally, but really, interestingly enough, in all of the states here in Australia currently. I was just in Victoria this week visiting my father, and it seems to be operating under a different set of laws and rules than the rest of the country. And I guess I want to ask you about the GAP. You know, I can see it over your left shoulder there. What does GAP stand for? And what are you wanting to achieve? What's your intention at the moment? Well, the GAP stands for Great Australian Party. It's a federal registered party. It was registered on the 7th of April of 2019. Because I needed to go back and deal with a motion that sitting part heard. It's motion 163, which I successfully passed in the High Court of Parliament, which is the Senate, on the 1st of December of 2016. So unfinished business, Pete. So, but I also needed to, I got a lot of following. And as much as things were a little bit unorthodox, you know, with the court hearings and having to face the media and the entourage. You know, like I said to one of the media, I said, you're half the problem. I said, you remind me of my old sheepdog. You keep getting around my feet. You know, I need to go to court and not be interrupted because it's it's very important. And 
the matters that I was raising are quite complex, but they're very bona fide. Okay, and, and the reason why I say they're very true and bona fide is because the former Solicitor General, he represented me in the High Court and he claimed yeah, there's a problem. And, you know, the highest legal minds that I've engaged as lawyers have all said they're all kings in grass castles. So, but they say, unfortunately, David Bennett is the, uh, the barrister or Queen's Counsel that represented me in the High Court. But, you know, they say it's the only system we've got and you just have to put up with it. Well, that's not good enough. <laughs> and so I thought, well, the only way I'm going to fix this is to bring the evidence that I have. So it's not an inference, it's fact. It's been established at a commission. You know, I wrote the terms of reference to the Royal Commission and gave it to Malcolm Turnbull. He effectively had a lot of problems calling a Royal Commission, Pete. And the reason why I couldn't call a Royal Commission is because effectively it would be a nonsense because to call a Royal Commission, I think it's the Royal Commission Act of 1903. And what was the Royal Commission for? Just to Banking Royal, Banking Royal Commission. Okay. Uh -huh. And he said, oh, it'll cost millions of dollars, it'll go on. But the Prime Minister has the executive power. And I said to Malcolm Turnbull at the time, how may you call a Royal Commission when you're under Queen of Australia and not, because that's not a Royal Commission. And that's why the government was very hesitant <laughs> because they couldn't call a Royal Commission. They had no authority to call it. But once they removed me out of parliament, you know, got the double G or the stone out of their sand shoe, then they came out and called a Royal Commission because I would have, I would have challenged that in the Senate because we need a bona fide and that's what a bona fide Royal Commission. And that's why the banks, what, what's happened, you know, the banks have been shown all this misconduct and what, has anyone been prosecuted or what's happened? Mm. Nothing, because it, it's a nonsense inquiry. The only ones that benefit out of it is the lawyers. So we just need honest government and we need to come back under our protection under the Commonwealth laws because when you made the, you know, about the Queen of Australia, what the Queen of Australia has has enabled things to happen, which you can see with this COVID-19, the Queen of Australia has allowed the states to rise above the laws of the Commonwealth. And as it clearly says in the Constitution and our magnificent framers, when they wrote the Constitution, you know, they, they had a lot of foresight in things that can challenge and they've really shut the door really nice and tight, is the stream can't rise above its source. So under the Queen of Australia, Australian law, the states have risen above the Commonwealth law. And that's why in Western Australia, we've got the Premier shutting down the borders and the government is trying to come in and take them to court. So it just shows you that, you know, they're, they're operating under powers through the Australia Act of 1986 to override the Constitution. And that can't happen because all laws are subject to it. So, you know, we can't become subservient to a nonsense jurisdiction. So, it all comes back to jurisdiction, Peter. That's, you know, you've either got the authority or you haven't. And like I, I used to be the member of a ski club down at Lake Norring and we had guys getting into the wrong toilet. So the, we thought the best way to make sure that everyone went into the correct jurisdiction is put outboards and inboards as a motorboat. So there was no confusion. So <laughs> that's, that's really what we've got to do in layman's terms. <laughs> I have a question for you and it, it's... I've been watching everything take place over the last few years and I've been in the firing line for certain, I've had the Australian Medical Association president attack me, I've had the health minister talk about me over the years. Now, my observation is mm. that in the government hierarchical system, let's take for instance, the ministers at the moment, the health minister, Greg Hunt. Greg Hunt. Yeah. From my understanding, these ministers, I mean, Greg Hunt's not a doctor, but he's no. the health minister. And I, I accept that and I, I understand that. But these ministers can go from being a health minister to an education minister to a different type of ministry like that. A jack of all trades and a master of none. That's what I'm asking. Because we put, there's so much faith and trust from the Australian public put in the hands of these ministers. 
but it seems like they move from department to department depending on and and I don't know what how how does that happen and how do you become excellent in your role if there's constant moving around can you yeah because you apply the law and what you see is the you know it's a hard to play a game of football when they move the goalposts okay but what you're referring to, they just don't move the goalposts. They remove the goalposts. So, you know, unless, <laughs> unless you've got a compass strapped to your head, you, you can sort of figure out where the goals might be to, to capture a score. And these people are not... So when you look for candidates, these people are selected by the political party. They're not sort of selected on their you know, their experience, you know. Their like skill set. Their skill set, that's correct. Mm-hmm. And all they've got to do in there, and you'll always see a politician will never, well, I don't refer to myself to as a politician. I like to refer to myself as a statesman or a senator. You know, there's a big difference, but, well, a formal one. But they never answer the question because they can't make a statement because, as you know, if you make a statement, you've got to prove it. But And that's why they'll never answer the question or they'll dive and, and then there's really, it's a rubber bullet that just sort of bounces off. So what I can't understand with the lockdown, you know, putting people in effect in house arrest, because that's really what it is. If you're a healthy person and what you're saying, if you've got a good immune system, I mean, that's what it's all about. It is a good immune system. I mean, that's why we have an, an immune system. And you keep healthy, you keep, you know, most times you keep well. But the whole point is, how do you have a chief medical officer give advice and then basically say there needs to be a fine? Where does he get that authority and power? Because the constitution doesn't give a medical officer the power. It only gets the power comes through an oath of office, which is where the people put the power, which is the power of attorney, at the ballot box. So this is where the states are usurping the powers of the crown, the constitution, and just running wild. And it can't happen. It is not permitted to happen. And that's the whole ethos of GAP. We've got to get out there and say to the people, we are losing our country. You've lost all your water rights. You know, look at the Northern Territory. We've got all the fracking. You know, we've got the original tribal elders of this country saying, what is going on? You know, they're losing their land. We are abusing one of the best assets we've got and we've got to stop that. And to stop it, we've got to come back under our laws. And that law is still there. It's just been sidelined. So in other words, get all the the muck off the bottom of the boat so the boat can plain. You know, it's just, it's really sad the way Australia is at the moment. And I look at these politicians and look, I've been in there. And I have to say, the time that I was in Parliament, if I didn't have my people around me, I would have been pretty miserable because I didn't enjoy their company. You know, Mm. and and that doesn't make me a proud Australian. What makes me a proud Australian is to get it off my chest and speak to people like you and, you know, just make people aware, that's all. And, you know, if people don't want to act on it or they say that I'm some conspiracy theorist, well, look, I'll put the evidence up, which is what I'm doing, and you rebut it, you know, because I'm not saying it, the law's saying it. And we still have a constitution, as you know. You can't say that we don't. But the Australian government is not the Commonwealth Parliament and it can't really use that, although they use it from time to time just to keep people thinking it still exists, but at law they can't. And that's that's the bottom line, Peter. You know, it really upsets me because I see a lot of people, you know, being a senator, I've witnessed firsthand, you know, I've pulled a gun away from a boy you know, I've got another guy that was up in Charters Towers where his son shot himself with a triple two. You know, and they, these people are just, you know, you can't breed our primary producers. You know, these guys have been out there case hardened for, you know, for generations and, and you can't breed those people. You can't bring in a corporate entity to run, a be, be like a guy that's born and bred out in, you know, uh, central Queensland, Norwest central Queensland. You can't do that. You just don't make those people over. over mm. We want to keep them. One of the things I like to do with my guests on the podcast is talk about solutions and whether you're optimistic for the future. 
and what would the steps need to be for, I guess, your dream or your reality that you would like to happen? What needs to happen? What are the solutions? What can we do? I like it when you say we. We are all Australian and we shall not discriminate against one another. And I understand that the original people of this land, we must respect them. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, we were the ones that came over here in effect. So we must respect their laws and what they stand for. And I think you've had some interaction with OSTF. Is that correct? I have, yes. And look, they've sent me a copy of the treaty skin and the law sticks have come and David Cole. In actual fact, we've been invited on our first trip up to Darwin and you're quite welcome to come along if you want to, to the healing camps in mid-July. So our bus that we're, you know, it's got all the sleeping cabins and it's actually, it's a nice outfit. And so we're on the road. So what we've got to do is there's a lot of love in this world, Peter, but there's no respect. And what we've got to do is we can see, you know, with the news, you know, it's a 72-hour cycle. You know, someone can attack you in the media and then after 72 hours, people tend to forget about it and it mm-hmm. dissol- it's a flare in the air and then it dissolves out. So what we've got to do, what I keep saying to our guys, we- we've got to keep sticking another Mallee root on the fire and <laughs> keep the fire going. And <laughs> <laughs> so we've got our wood trailer on the back of the truck, so to speak. So we're out there putting another Mallee root on the fire and keep it going so people see it. And so how do we fix it? It's the people have the supreme power under the system we have now. We've got to come back within jurisdiction. And one of the ways of doing that, which, you know, I was never a big fan of Pauline Hanson, but I admired her tenacity, although, you know, I tend to think, you need a bigger motor. But one of her policies that stood out, and I actually have the former president of One Nation, Ian Nelson, he's the president of GAP, is the, you know, the people initiated referenda. And that was to allow members of society to come in and tell their members to do what they want them to do in parliament. Well, that's not happening. We know that's not happening in the big party. So What GAP has done now, I've invested, well, the party's invested heavily in the GAP app. And the GAP app is an app that you'll get on your phone and you participate. Everyone participates yourself with what you stand for, what I stand for. Everyone comes into a think tank and they put in short submissions And then we, you know, we have our policies on health, education, employment, you know, primary industries, you know, all our our policies are up on the website. And we're going to add more too because they're not cast in stone or set in stone. So we're about giving, we just want to be, so so when, if the media come out and say, which they've said, oh, you know, the gap parties are lefty and all this. No, we're gun barrel straight. We're straight down the middle. And we're about, you know, I may get a whole heap of candidates that may want to come in on GAP and as party leader, you know, I haven't known them long enough to sort of see whether they might have skeletons or dinosaur fossils in the closet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and not that I'm any saint, but, you know, it's about that person that they elect, he's just the messenger. So when the media come out and say, no, it's not me making the, the claim or statement, it's the people. And the people want this. So that's what this law provides. It allows the people to do that. So we've got the Gap app, which we think is going to be a fantastic tool. And we don't see any opposition to it from the other parties because if they came out with it, well, then, you know, it's pretty much lifting their corporate veil. So we see that as a great tool. So that takes people to the next step to where their voice actually goes into the chamber. So let's say I was re-elected as a senator and I'm going in to look at legislation. We'd put it up and people say, yes, no, what do you want to vote for? And I go in with the result. You know, it has to be make sure it's all teased out properly. And that's what I'll do. Even if I think, you know, it might be different, you know, it's not me. I have to then register as that person because all I am is I'm there for the people. So I've got to act for the people as a public trustee. And that's the basic principles of it, Peter. And that, that'll fix it. 
Does that make sense? It does. Mm. Let's so do it. <laughs> it, it. I can tell you now, Peter, you know, I know Jackie Lambie. I know Malcolm Roberts. You know, Darren Hinch. And I said, do you understand the Constitution? Do you understand it? And they don't. And that's their constitutional problem. That's like being a mechanic and not having the service manual on the car that you're supposed to service. <laughs> Thinking, oh, shit, I don't know. You can't. This is dealing with people's rights. This is dealing with people's beliefs. This is dealing with what people want. How can you represent someone and you don't know? See, the good thing, when I sat in the Senate seat, it was like sitting in the cockpit of an F-111. I'm like, oh, look at this. Here's a missile. Push that. Bang. Next minute, you've got the member over the other side. They're jumping up. And I'm thinking, look at the power I've got at my hands here. It was just amazing. And... You know, even Stephen Parry, the president of the Senate, came to me and said, and even Malcolm Turnbull, said, mate, what do we got to do to settle you down? And this is true. And Stephen Parry said, how do we get you to come over to the Liberal Party? <laughs> and I said, mate, that just won't be happening. It can't mm -hmm. happen because I've given my commitment to the people at One Nation. But then when Pauline essentially threw me under the bus, and I must say, Pete, the best way to not get thrown under a bus is to actually have one yourself, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm sitting in now. You don't see me under it. You actually see me inside it, which is good because it's hard to get thrown under it when you're actually inside it. <laughs> you know? So, but when Pauline turned her back on the Royal Commission and all that and basically became a Liberal, which she did because Malcolm Turnbull invited her down to Sydney, both her and James Ashby. That's when, you know, they didn't offer the support to me. And I actually, Motion 163 is the motion that's calling whether the Queen of Australia has got jurisdiction in Australia, which all went silent. I mean, now Brandis has gone to the UK as High Commissioner and Pauline Hanson's pretty well much gone quiet. But, yeah, I had to step outside One Nation but still stick to the policy. But I was forced to go as an independent because, mm. you know, I didn't want to go to the High Court, you know. I, the High Court didn't have jurisdiction and they came into me and said, you must go down to the High Court because you can't bring the Senate into disrepute. So I was sort of, I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll go down and, you know, check out all the exits down there. Can I ask you a question, Rod, is who would not like you to continue to do what you're doing? I mean, for the Australian people, who out there would look at your policies and go, that doesn't suit us? Or, and who in the government does not want to see you and the party succeed? That's a hard question to answer. You know, as much as Malcolm Turnbull came out with his book, he did actually say a couple of things. You know, when you're a prime minister, you've got to, you know, there's other people that sort of have the levers behind the scene. And, you know, give Clyde Palmer his due, he's came out and he knows that. And, the media is very powerful in pushing an agenda. But I think if we hold the government to account, there's nowhere for them to go. And I'm not coming out and making any unsubstantiated claims. Mm -hmm. I'm coming out and stating the facts, <laughs> what, what the records show, what the parliament shows, and what the constitution provides for. And I don't see, once that becomes better accepted by the public, I don't see how the media can rebut what I'm saying. I, I can't see that they can put up a challenge to that. And that's a good thing about having a good case. And I've got a good case. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I've been watching American politics over the last four years. It was actually Trump that got me interested because when he was running against Clinton many, those four years ago, so many of my friends and colleagues were really, really upset. They were angry, they were pissed off, they, and it was all directed at Trump. Mm. And it was interesting. One day I said to them, I said, why are you all so upset? I said, he hasn't become president yet. You're bitching and moaning every single day that I see you when I go to work. And you're bitter and you're angry and, you know, your energy is not that of love and happiness. And, you mm. know, some, something's changed. And you're in this, like, feeding shark frenzy, feeding frenzy every day. I said, how is it going to affect your life? They said, fuck off, Pete. Don't disrupt our 
our energy. We like to be like this, basically. We like to attack this person. And I said to them, I said, he's going for a job. I said, why don't you evaluate the person after four years of him doing that job instead of basing something off, off what he has said in the past? And we've all said something in the past that we've probably gone, <laughs> that probably wasn't the smartest thing for me to say at that particular point in time, but you cannot be judged for the rest of your life over things that you've said in the past. We all have the ability to change. And I'm just wondering because there's so much, still so much hatred and aggression towards that man. And it generally comes from the media and you being on the receiving end of negative media and myself being on the receiving end of negative media and seeing the lies and the, and the mistruths that they like to associate, well, they have in my case anyway. And I'm, and I'm watching what's happening with Trump, and I'm not saying that I'm, I'm for him or against him, but I find it fascinating that here's a fella, regardless of his political alignment, but potentially somebody that they never saw coming has got it into a position of power. And one of the things that I said to my friends was, regardless of what you think of Trump, I said, maybe he's a catalyst for change. Maybe he's a catalyst to shake the tree and see what falls out. Maybe he's not the savior, but maybe the person afterwards or the one afterwards, because of him entering the scene, will have a ripple effect that we, we still can't actually not see yet. Because if it was, went the other way with Clinton, I feel like we'd be getting more of the same and it seemed like it was going down a downward spiral or downward trajectory and that's just my perception so i guess I, I don't know whether it's a statement or a question but one thing that keeps popping into my head lately is never underestimate the power of one person with conviction and what they can achieve regardless of the obstacles or walking into the storm so to speak and i feel that's a little bit or a lot with, with you and your team as well, is that you're on a path, whether you like it or not, to keep going. And I'm sure there's probably days where you're like, oh, fuck it, I don't want to do this. But there's something inside of you that just keeps going. So talk to me about the power of one individual with a solid direction. Well, the power of one individual, it, it's like when I, I, I keep coming back to farming. And I, I know... People underestimate primary producers, but they're very resilient and they can go through some tough times. And the thing is, we all start, you know, farms at one stage used to be, I think, in the early days, 500 acres, and then they went up to 2,000 acres, and then they keep, you know, 15,000, and like this guy's 40,000, and some of these guys are doing, you know, 1.1 million acres in, in station country. But if you set your groundwork right, and you do everything right. One person, like, you know, when I was doing my farming operation outside my manufacturing, and you, you get the tools, you can do it. And it's just being organised, getting the right equipment. So what we've done with GAP is we've registered the party. And I know the four guys, Daryl O'Brien, you know, Neil Pitchinen and Darren Dixon and myself, they're guys I could go to war with, no question. And I'm so proud of them, so proud. I can ring them at 3 o'clock in the morning and they'll take a call. They are available 24-7 for the best interest of winning this home for the Australian people. And what my team have done, because it's not all me, Peter, it's my team, although, you know, I established on the founder and party leader of GAP and I have a responsibility, but... I have a responsibility of every person. You know, whether they hate, love me or whatever, I have a responsibility to all Australians. And we've got to get bring this respect back. But one of the tools that we've got is we've got evidence, Peter. And once you've got evidence, then you can provide it to the other party and say, now rebut it or prove against it. And this evidence that we've got, Peter, is through the freedom of information from the Attorney General's Department and the Prime Minister in Cabinet and the State Parliament. And, you know, they've all admitted that they can't see <laughs> where their authority links back to the Constitution. Hmm. They've said it in writing. I mean, what more do we need? But 
they just it's a bit like so once you've got the tools and the evidence is the tools because it's not hearsay it's a fact and what they call presumption if people say if the presumption if that's where it's set the other person's got to, to overcome the presumption they must prove against and that's just what's kept me going if i didn't have the 1988 constitutional report i hadn't gone into the senate i hadn't witnessed for my own eyes and i hadn't gone down to the high court and you know, and hadn't had some of the best legal minds represent me. You know, the money, amount of money I've poured into the courts, I own the courts, actually. But, you know, there's nothing better than investing in your self-interest, I suppose. But, you know, they've all come back and said the system's broken. That's all we've got. We've, well, that's not good enough. Australia can't run with a broken crankshaft, can it? It, it can't have a motor that's not running uh, like a well-oiled machine. And it's not a well-oiled machine unless the people come together and fix it. And that's what I'm saying. Now that I'm invest, you know, I've, I've got behind a party. I mean, initially we were behind it uh, monetary-wise. Now we're starting to get some people that were very inspired with my maiden speech. And I take nothing away from my maiden speech, Peter. I mean, I don't know if you've seen my maiden speech, but... I know, haven't, no. Well, I just let fly. And Malcolm Turnbull brought me to his office and he, when I walked in, I was with Michaelia Cash, you know, and went in and he was playing it on his computer screen and he got up and he shook my hand and said, mighty job. <laughs> this is one of the best speeches to ever come out of this place. He had to say that. And he said, you know, we need to start working together. And I said, of course, you know, I'm okay with that. And that's when I had a bit of interaction with him. But, you know, but old Malcolm, he's, well, not old Malcolm, but Malcolm's a keen Republican, isn't he? Like he, you know, he pushes for the Republic and he, you know, I mean, he would have been, you know, dry reaching, calling a Royal Commission, being an advocate for a Republic. So that would be like taking a Fox Toxin pill, wouldn't it? He would have. Just, you know. I used to cook for him, actually. In the early days when he was running for election, myself and my team were the caterers and we would go to the fundraisers that he'd do at his house. And yep. I, have, I, I do have to say that throughout my interaction, this is going back probably 15 years ago, I'd say, mm. is that maybe even longer, is that he was a very generous person with his time for myself and my staff that were there with me in his house and we ended up catering for his daughter's wedding daisies as well and put on a great, great spread of food. And he was always very respectful to me and my team and, and that's something that I, I will always respect him for. Yeah, and I guess, you know, you've got to look at these guys are out playing, you know, it's a bit like playing for the opposition footy side. They're out there playing the game hard and they play for what they believe to play for. And, mm. you know, and that's what I say to people you know, Australia's got this builds people up and, you know, and then pulls them down or, mm -hmm. you know, like if, if you're not kicking a goal, Peter, or, you know, people are quick to judge you and call you everything. And, and that's the frustration of the public at the moment. And, you know, I say to people, you know, I got attacked on my businesses, which, you know, I was one of many 4,000 farmers that, win that landmark loan book, which has been well publicised and came out at the Royal Commission. But what people got to realise, fail is a first attempt in learning and, and not be frightened of that. But just because someone doesn't do as well doesn't mean they're not... It's like a footy side, just because they don't win the grand final one year doesn't mean they can't come back and play at that level and win it for the next three seasons. And, you know... Australian people are quick to judge. The media is quick to judge, but I don't judge anyone. All I'm interested in is the law, and until the people change that law at a referendum, well, then that's what stands, and that's what I have to uphold. And as a sworn public officer, I'm a Commonwealth public officer, I've sworn an oath in the public chamber, you know, I've signed the registry, without fear or favour to uphold the law. Well, you know, <laughs> that's what I've had to do. And that's really the bottom line. I'm not interested in anything else. I gave a commitment to my wife. I'm still married. And I gave a commitment to the Australian people. And I uphold that commitment. Otherwise, what's the purpose? Who am I? Where's, 
you know, where's my manhood if I can't feel honoured within myself? That's really it. So, you know, and that's the whole ethos of Great Australian Party. And, you know, the other purpose with the app, because a lot of good people don't come forward because they think they're going to get, you know, attacked by the media, which is right. You know, the media can destroy your family, but with the Gap app, the candidate can say, well, you know, hands up, boys, don't shoot the messenger. It's the people saying it. I'm not saying it. You know, it's the people saying it. So that keeps them in check and really gives us the best way into the Westminster system, which is still available. And it needs to happen now because Malcolm Turnbull's already and Albanese and, and the Greens are coming out saying that, you know, if the, if the Queen, God bless her soul, she keeps around for a while, but if she was to pass away, we go to Republic. Well, the question is, the people say, he says he'll go to a plebiscite. Under what authority can he go to a plebiscite? He can't do it under some authority that's not in sync with the Constitution. But if the people don't um, come back and object to that, well, the law doesn't protect them, you see. And, and people just need to wake up to their responsibility. And that's what I've had to do. You know, and we're going to see a lot of small businesses suffer out of this COVID-19. It wasn't their fault. You know, we're going to see the banks, unfortunately, take moves. And, you know, we need to protect our people. Our people are the beneficiaries and the catalysts of, you know, small business. That's what runs this country, small business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you see a business go down, they're quick to kick it in the guts, but they don't realise that that business might have been going along for 30 years, you know, employing people, their kids going through private school and, all this generation and the banks just come in and kick them to death. And that's what I said in my maiden speech. You know, I've been in a crocodile role and, and, you know, when you take out a loan with the bank, you know, it's like sleeping with a wild animal. You never know when it's going to attack. And what I've witnessed, I said that, you know, bank loans should have health warning signs on the bottom. If you take out this loan, it could lead to serious injury or death because we've got to have a lot of farmers shoot themselves with the aggression of our banks post-GFC. I think it, it was horrific. You've got no idea, Peter. And, you know, a lot of that was caught on 60 Minutes. These guys just coming out purporting to be someone they're not, saying, hey, we've got your farm. Uh, no, it doesn't work like that. And that's where the states have just gone rogue. The states have gone rogue, and that's what GAP needs to bring back into line. But we can't do it without the support of the people. That's it, really. So how do we promote or how do we get the support of the people for you what do you require i just want people to be open and honest i want people to have a look at the facts we'll be on the road they can come to our seminar we're open and honest about it how best support people i guess the people need to support themselves and they need to look at what gap has got to offer gap is a clean skin okay it's a clean skin party it's not influenced by any big, and well, it can't be because at the end of the day, that's the beautiful thing about the system that we're going to carry in for our policies. So it's the people that will be, they can go onto our website or onto the Gap app and they can look at the results 24 7. They can, you know, it's available to them, you know, and that's what it's, it's an open and honest party. And we don't want to be judged. We're just interested in the law. And I just want people to, you know, I guess support the Australian brothers <laughs> that are going on the road with their bus and just hold respect. And before they criticise, have a look at the evidence because this evidence is just not here. So it's come out of Parliament. It's on the record. These are reports, commission reports that have been done. You can't get more better evidence than that, Peter. And you know what? The public's paid for it. You know, we've seen where the High Court's now releasing these documents of Whitlam. Well, we've actually got secret documents of Whitlam to where he was talking, the minutes of the notes talking to the Queen. And when he was dealing with the departure and Whitlam said he had the supreme authority, had more authority than the governor, which was a nonsense. He he came out openly said that. He just, Labor has got a lot to answer for. Labor, to be honest, I mean, look at the parliament now, Peter. Look, at, look, there's another one gone down for Chinese influences in, I read this morning, you know, we've got Qantas now sacking 6,000 people, not wanting to go overseas, you know, ground the planes, they can ground their own planes. 
But how can you stop a person that's healthy from going somewhere? And there's no, all the experts are coming out with this. Uh, it's, the, people have lost trust. And that's the real issue. They've lost trust with the judiciary, our parliament and our chief medical officers. It's just too much. It's not good. And so, it's t- so how do people support you? Is it, is, what's the next stage? Do they go to your, to the GAP party and register? So take me through the steps here if they want to support you or learn more. They can become a member for free. They can become a paying member, which gives them a, the right to participate in the GAP app. A free membership allows you to look at the results, but if you want to put in submissions and whatever, there's different levels of paying membership. And yeah, we just we don't force people to become a member of GAP. It just even if they get on and just support us, that's all we want is to look at what we've got to offer and support because we are a different party. Although parties, in a sense, are not accepted under the constitution, I understand that. But by the time we get to the election, we can still have a party outside it and then those individuals go in essentially as an independent but affiliated, so to speak, in a, in a way with the party. So to get around anything, we're only doing everything pursuant to the laws of the Commonwealth and that's it, not, not the state, the Commonwealth. So, so we're, you- playing, we're playing at the AFL level. We're not playing junior footy. I always say the state politics is junior footy. So, so do you see yourself as a potential Prime Minister candidate? Well, put it this way, I'm not frightened in going forward. I mean, look, they may come out and claim that I'm not eligible. I've always said that I am. Do I see myself as a Prime Minister? Well, that's arguable, isn't it? The Prime Minister, you know, should there be a Prime Minister top end of town with it all? You know, I just want to see myself as someone that's, whatever capacity I might, be given someone to run over the line through the ribbon and pop the bottles of champagne and what however it gets me there even if it's in an old dinghy with a with an outboard you know the tires the tires got the bus has got flat tires even if i'm running down toe poppers run whatever gets us over the line peter (laughs) you know what i mean it might be you that might you know it could be look we have to look at people's qualities but you don't have to be someone that's well educated to be a prime minister it's you know the captain of a footy team is only as good as his players around him and that's it 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 has to be teamwork teamwork Mm -hmm. and the support of the people you know your fans and and really you know all about that so and if it continues the way it's continuing currently with the the systems that are in place Give us a sneak peek of 5, 10, 20 years down the track for Australians if this, what I would call bullshit, continues. Well, you've hit the nail on the head. It is what you say it is. I dread to think because we won't have a say. And, you know, I look at my kids and, you know, I think they have every right to, you know, Australia was a lucky country. I mean, Australia's become a good place as long as you do as you're told now, you know, and you've got to be politically correct. But, you know, we just have to look at why the people now have to act because when you look at the the people that we put our trust in, they're not coming across good. You know, we're seeing this High Court judge now who's coming under immense pressure, the judiciary in disrepute. I mean, there was a judicial prosecuting officer come out saying judges of the West Australian Supreme Court were doing the same and they were compromised and that's not good. It's now really broken the system. So... If we sit back and do nothing now, we're actually complicit to what we know and then we're actually allowing this to happen. I don't think that's in the best interest of democracy and that's not something we could say we're proud Australians to allow to do. We, like I said at the start of this meeting, you know, it's when good men do nothing, Peter. Mm. And as much as there's a bit of controversy around, well, there is a lot of controversy around myself and, you know, obviously some around you, but At the end of the day, we know in our heart that we're a good man and we're actually, don't criticise someone that's come out on the front line and in a a sense put his, you know, cock on the block. Don't criticise a person like that because, you know, many people have run out of the trenches firing and you just hope that the other blokes are going to come out of the trench and, and they do and that's what we need to be. Gaps coming out of the trench we're firing and we need all the other people to come out of the trench too because we need our country. We need our country back. We've lost our country, Peter. Mm. At law, we've lost our country. 
And that's why, you know, Cara at Four Corners did the One Nation. She came to me about the documentary of Pauline Hanson. And I said, Cara, look, I'll look at that. But why don't you go and have a look at Andrew Robb? Now, here we go to your listeners, Andrew Robb. Go and look at him. Andrew Robb was a member for the Liberal Party. And just, I want to get your opinion on this, Peter. Andrew Robb was a member of the Liberal Party and he did the Trans-Pacific Partnership and he entered into a deal with the 99-year lease of the Darwin port. Now, who would get rid of a port? You know, they were looking at getting rid of the port in Fremantle. I mean, that is disaster to a country. You know, you can grow all the best commodity, but if someone controls your port, you know, you can send everyone broke. Mm. This is the mentality of our political parties, the current ones. So, well, I wouldn't say not Gap, excluding Gap, I should say. But have a look at Andrew Robb. He's now on a pension with the government and have a look at how much he gets on the board of the directors of the Chinese company that he did the 99-year lease to. He he gets something like $87,000 a month. (laughs) You know, and they go, well, you know, yep, well, yeah, he does. So she exposed that. And then he sort of felt, you know, you couldn't do that under Commonwealth law. It wouldn't permit you to do that. This is what's happening. And look at the conduct of the people that the major parties have got in there. But yet we see it on the media and people think, oh, yeah, well, we don't have any power to do anything about it. Well, it's about time we wake up and say we do have the power. The people have the power in this country under the Westminster system, but they won't when it becomes a republic. And we are going to go to a republic or close to it because we're already in that. And this is the sad part. They've they've sort of got us to think that we're under the constitution, but in actual fact, we're actually experiencing the early stages of being in a real republic. So the future of Australia is not good. And that's why I'm standing up doing what I'm doing. Mm. Warts and all, Peter, warts and all. (laughs) That's your authentic self, brother. Love it. And I want to just tell you, I've loved this conversation. I love you. Rod. And I think I introduced you as Ron, actually, because I've had so many emails today and so many things. So apologies for that if I did. But thanks well, for I hope I didn't lose you. I mean, it, it's, I hope I made sense to people. You know, I'm quite happy to come back for another interview if you need, if people have got questions. And maybe if they come on to the uh, Great Australian Party website or whatever and they ask the questions, of what this interview does, I can have myself and my team answer those questions for them, only if they want to. I'm not trying to look at coming to you, Peter, to get the big profile or whatever. I don't want to be... I'm coming to you as a person that's a proud Australian, a family man, and shares the same passion as what I do. And I, I hope that you see some good in what we're doing and see you around with what we're doing. And I, I think you're most welcome, like everyone else, you know, and that, that's it. Mate. So, yeah. Uh, Well, I've loved it. I've had an education. And as I've said to many different politicians around the world that I have met, I said, if you and when you get into a position of power, I'd love to be able to contribute my little bit, whatever that may be, whether it be, who knows, who knows, whether it's just sharing your message or whatever it may be. I have no grand delusions of, of anything like that. But if I can be of service to the people, that's what I would love to do. What about we say this, Pete, to finish it off? Once we get all this over the line, we can probably say we'll be as happy as a mosquito on a nudist beach. And uh, I think that <laughs> we're just going to hang in there and we'll get there, Pete. With your support and all the people's support, we'll get there. And because the law says we can, the law puts us there, we've just got to come home as all Australians. We are all Australians. Let's just get up and go for the cup. And that's what it is. Beautiful. And I love, I love that you're working with the original people of Australia too. Yeah, yeah, and maybe there's an opportunity when we're up there. Please, you're you're welcome to come up. I could do with a few healing camps up there, Peter. You know, <laughs> that, that's an understatement. I you'll probably lose me. I'll be offline for a couple of months. I'll be in for a real service. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, mate. All the best on your journey, and thank you for being you and for putting yourself out there. I know it's no, a, on, it, I know it can be a bit lonely for some that do that, but you've got a friend with me. Good on you. Thanks, Peter, and I accept that. Thank you. Cheers, buddy. Have a beautiful day. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
If you would like to become a qualified health coach, then the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, or IIN for short, can help you achieve your goals. I completed their health coaching course many years ago, which has been one of the catalysts for my own journey into what I now love to do, which is to help people achieve greater health through the sharing of information through my books, seminars, podcasts, TV shows, and films. I recommend IIN for anyone wishing to pursue a career in the health coaching and wellness space. IIN is a one-year course, so that if you're a full-time worker, busy parent, or wherever you are in your life, it is flexible enough so you'll be able to complete all the required curriculum. Please see the link included in the podcast show notes or my website to access the free sample class and first module of their program. This will give you a great taste of the format as well as the structure, and you can also utilize my special discount that I can offer you if you decide to sign up. Make sure you tell the admissions team that you're part of the Pete Evans Tuition Savings to claim your very substantial discount. Please visit integrativenutrition.com or email admissions at integrativenutrition.com. The information, views and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be treated as a substitute for nutritional, medical or other advice by a qualified professional. Guests in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions. Nothing in this podcast should be used to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any medical condition. Neither Pete Evans nor any sponsor endorse any views, opinions, or conclusions expressed or shared in this podcast.